The Trench's local government at work, the show that delves into the municipal stories that are making the municipal headlines from across Canada. Today, we are joined by guest co-host Craig Bullitt, Atlantic Canada lead for Strategic Steps. And we are taking the show to the province where the first transatlantic wireless transmission was received, Newfoundland and Labrador. But before we do that, Craig and I have some big stories to dive into. So put on your earphones and head over to Elliston Puffin View Insight and get ready to dive into the political trenches. Craig, big shoes to fill today. Are you ready to do this? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I think I'm ready. I mean, I don't fly glider planes and I'm not a world renowned expert on local government. I'm, I may be like a regional expert on local government, but uh, yeah, I, I'll do what I can in this one moment. Okay, so if I call you Ian a few times during the show, please apologize. Oh. <laughs> Just used to it. So there we Bring go. Bring it on. Uh, so let's head into our very first story. And school is out, summer heat is setting in, and the children of a small Quebec town southwest of Montreal will soon be able to spend their days shooting hoops in the streets. Well, that is if they have filled out the necessary paperwork. In June, the municipality of Lake Cordes published a reminder to residents of a bylaw passed last September that authorizes free play zones on residential streets as long as children acquire the signatures of at least two-thirds of households on that said street. Quote, by applying for a free play zone, you increase the level of safety for the youth in your neighborhood and allow them to play legally on the streets, the message read. Now, Isabel LaBerge, who works at a town's primary school and her 11-year-old son, sometimes plays in the street with her friends, with his friends. She thinks most residents of the town, about 45 kilometers outside of Montreal, were unaware of the bylaw. And the way the municipality communicated the change confused uh, some residents who feared playing in front of their homes would mean that it would be outlawed. Quote, I find it a little bit exaggerated, but at the same time, I understand the security concerns because there's a reoccurring issue in the community with people driving fast, not making their stops, though I'm not sure this will really help either, end quote, she said in an interview with CTV. The director of communications for the municipality said that so far the municipality has not established any free play zones, but... She said children will still be able to play freely, and the bylaw simply allows the creation of official free play zones with visible signage. Now, Craig, I am of an age, and mm. I can't believe I'm saying that, I'm of a certain age where I can remember going out and playing on the streets with my brother, with my friends in the summer, playing hockey. I did not play basketball, but I did play hockey on the streets, and I never had to sign any waiver, and my parents didn't... I, I assume my parents didn't think it was there was any safety concerns. Is this municipality going too far to ensure safety here? Or is the municipality striking the right balance, do you think, in safety versus potential people getting hit? So I think there's a couple questions. One is about balance, for sure. How much do you need to do to ensure children's safety? I mean, I think... You know, you could say go as far as you need to go to ensure to ensure children's safety. We used to yell car, and that seemed to be enough. And when you someone yelled car, you got off the street, the car slowed down, and it went by. And I understand I'm 110 years old, so I that really may not apply anymore. Um, I I think the bigger question for me is the focus of who has to act. Where's the onus here? So I don't know the community well. I've read what you've read in terms of the, the article. To me, this doesn't seem like an issue that households or children should be trying to fix. This is a speeding problem. This is a behavior on the part of drivers, not children. And my concern, like I, I, I was struck by a couple of the, the quotes from the article. One was this idea that it would allow kids to play legally. I can't believe I'm reading an article where the phrase play legally is included, but here we are, welcome to 2024. Um, and I'm also struck by the idea that somehow, and this was in the article, this will increase safety. And I don't know that it will, and I'll tell you why. If I'm a driver who's prone to speeding anyway, 
or running stop signs or taking corners too fast or just generally distracted driving, not paying attention, which I think it's safe to say is a bit of an epidemic period now. Like I'm, I'm not discounting that. It's a very big problem. But if I'm the kind of person who takes part in that kind of behavior on a regular basis, and now I know there are areas of the community where kids are not legally allowed to play what's going to be the impact on my driving in those areas? There's certainly no impetus on my part now if I use that sort of twisted logic to say, mm, I should probably slow down and take a look. But to me, the balance is an issue, but the target is the bigger issue. What have they done? What, what other options have they exhausted to try to curb, pardon the pun, bad drivers in their neighborhoods? That's the issue not the people who might be on the sidewalk or on the street or crossing the street or playing in the street. So one of the areas that I found interesting in this story, and it actually came from the mother that I talked about was there was some confusion about the original bylaw that they passed last year around outlawing actual safety. Now you've worked with municipalities in Newfoundland and Labrador, how, and well, throughout Atlantic Canada as uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, as with the Atlantic Mayor's Congress, how important is it for municipalities to, and I hate to use this analogy, but it's the best one that I can think of right now, the KISS rule, keep it simple, stupid, right? When you're uh, yep. communicating to people, you have to keep it simple enough that people can understand. And there's no misunderstanding or people think taking things out of context saying, well, I thought you're outlawing playing on the streets in front of my house. How important is it for municipalities to keep it simple? It's extraordinarily important. The challenge is that lots of times they're dealing with issues that are not simple issues. So you've got a very nuanced issue. Sometimes it's an issue with a lot of complicated bylaw or legal uh, implications that, that stem from it. Um, so it's important to keep it simple, but accurate. And in this case, again, I don't know the municipality, but the work I've done with municipalities in the last 20 years tells me that the vast majority are fairly small and they probably don't have communications staff or access to communications consultants who would help them with this sort of thing. They're doing the best they can with what they have. And even when you have those sort of outside or inside resources to help you craft a message, um, it will things will get confused by the general public. Uh, so it's it is incredibly important to keep it simple. It's incredibly important to keep it accurate. Um, and we've got time. And I'd love to talk about just the liability side of this, like what? Because to me, the question is, what's actually driving this? I mean, clearly, children's safety is driving it. But what's driving this particular action? And I think sometimes what drives smaller municipalities like this is fear of legal action and liability. And the approach most of them take is because the liability issue is so enormous and there's so much resources, legal and otherwise technical behind it, if they get sued or if somebody comes after them, that their reaction is to simply say, well, we can't do any of that now. We have to stop all of that because nuance doesn't work anymore because we're going to get pulled into court and we're going to get torn apart and it's not worth it. I want to turn to story two now, and we're heading to Ontario. The lawyer for two Stratford, Ontario residents who were banned from city buildings after speaking out at a council meeting says the move is a threat to democracy and that his clients were simply exercising their right to critique elected officials and public policy. Quote, I've never seen anything like this where people who are simply criticizing city council and members of staff have been banned outright, said the lawyer David Donnelly. Quote, this is why we pay taxes and why people fought and died for our rights in Canada, end quote. You simply cannot bar people from council because you don't like what they're saying, he added. 
Now, last month, Stratford resident Mike Sullivan received a letter from the city lawyers stating he is temporarily banned from all city facilities and from contacting staff for up to three months. The letter said Sullivan has engaged in behavior that is disrespectful, derogatory, inappropriate, and vexatious. I love that word. Whenever it comes up, I need to read it. And contrary to Stratford, Stratford's respectful workplace policy. Quote, you have made numerous derogatory and misleading comments against several members of the city's senior administrative staff, stated the letter dated April 4th, 2024. Now, Sullivan is a former NDP MP who represented York Southwestern in Toronto from 2011 to 2015 and an organizer of the citizens advocacy group Get Concerned Stratford and was one of the two individuals who had been banned. He said a third person has received a written letter. Now, the mayor of the community in an interview with CBC declined to specify what the inappropriate behavior was, but said it's important to take action when the safety of members in city facilities is threatened because of a safe environment is a shared responsibility of council, staff, and the public. Now, Craig, harassment of officials is on the rise, both administratively and elected. How do you think municipalities should balance the tone of respectful dialogue and citizen, while ensuring that citizens have the right to voice their opposition of the issues at City Hall? So this one, um, this one really, I'm going to say got me going, but uh, this idea, the statements that the lawyer made off the top, that people fought and died in wars for this. No, they didn't. I take real umbrage with that. We just, in Newfoundland and Labrador, just uh, repatriated our unknown soldier from World War I uh, from France back to St. John's Newfoundland. We have a national war memorial down there. So we are in, at the moment steeped in why people fight and die in wars around democracy. Democracy does not mean yelling at threatening in a meeting, outside a meeting, physical violence or intimidation. That's not democracy. Democracy is a system, a system of an exchange of ideas. And we seem to have gotten to a point in the world uh, and our neighbors to the South are helping with this. You're seeing it happening in France right now, although it's not necessarily a left or right wing thing, but vexatious politics seems to be where it's at these days. And this idea that if you can get a few seconds of yourself saying something snarky, but perhaps dangerous, but that you know it's sort of it, it it plays well on the gram or something like that, then that's all you really need to do. And I would say, you know, I, I just came back from a, a municipal conference in uh, Summerside, PEI. I was at an MNL one. A municipality in Newfoundland Labrador one a few months ago. I was at CAMA in Bant, Alberta. The harassment of municipal officials, as you said, elected or staff, is at unparalleled levels. And I don't mean just quantity. I mean, and for lack of a better term, the quality, the type, the ferociousness of the attacks is way beyond what we've seen. And and what you hear in the media and what people will talk about at conferences from the stage is just the tip of the iceberg. When you speak to people one-on-one, -on -one, the stories they have about people following them home, about you know threats of physical violence on a weekly basis, just part of the job, you know, as you're walking to your car and that sort of thing. That's the context that this decision was made in. So context is always important. I don't believe in this case that Mr. Sullivan and others just showed up one day out of the clear blue sky, made, lost their tempers, made some nasty comments, and then the hammer was brought down on them. I don't think for one second that's what happened. I think this was a mayor and council with limited tools presently to deal with that kind of stuff, who got frustrated, who were legitimately worried about staff or councils, uh, councillors and had to do something. And I, I find it funny that anybody would think that a council 
would sort of lightheartedly make a decision that they're going to ban a resident from city hall or town hall. It's just laughable. It, none of these councillors wanted to do this. I can't imagine, but they felt they had to. Craig, this next story brought to mind that famous question, how much could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? But for this story, it's more like how many municipal councillors should sit around a table if that table was made up of their own councillors. Now, Digby Town Council held a special council meeting in June to discuss the question around how many councillors should sit around the council table. The discussion, though wide-ranging, centered around two options, the status quo of mayor and six councillors or reduced council to mayor and four councillors. Now, under the Nova Scotia provincial legislation, every municipal council in the province has to conduct a study and then report to the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. For units with polling districts, they have to review the boundaries and number of polling districts. In the case of Digby, where the councillors are elected at large, they have to review the number of councillors. In fact, Council decided to proceed with a review of three options, status quo, mayor and six councillors, reducing mayor to and four councillors, or whether councillors should be elected at large in polling districts. Now, the councillors pre present all indicated they, they don't think polling districts were practical options for the town of the size of Digby. Craig, this is an interesting story in itself, let alone the tongue twister that I added in for just for mm -hmm. hilarity's sake for us. Should municipalities, not only in the province of Nova Scotia, review the size of the councillors on a reoccurring basis? Or is it something better to leave to the status quo that's currently there? So I think all elements of governance need to be reviewed on a regular basis. Bylaws, policies, your rules of procedure, your code of conduct, all that stuff. The structure of your council is one of those things, albeit it's a much bigger piece to do and a much more politically sensitive piece to do because you are theoretically telling a bunch of your colleagues yeah, you're not going to be here for the next election. You're also telling residents, potentially, um, you don't need as much say as you think you do in the running of this municipality. That's not what you're trying to say, but back to our uh, point we made in another story, what people hear from communications like this is a totally different thing. So my sense, every province deals with this issue in a different way. Uh, in some cases, the municipality doesn't really get involved at all. The province might just decide you're too big, you're too small, whatever. Um, for me, the the question is all about good governance. And can you deliver good governance? Because I noticed, you know, the story did talk about, and they seem to be split. They they weren't ignorant of this. I mean, there was members of council who were saying, no, no, this is about good governance and making sure people have a say or have somebody representing them. At the same time, there was councillors talking about trying to save money. And I think this is this is a recurring story especially in smaller municipalities right across the country, that they're having to balance, you know, if money wasn't an object, what could we do? How would we run this thing? But of course, for a lot of them, money is a very big object. And I think they talked about 35 grand or something like that for the cost of a particular committee, which doesn't sound like a lot of money to a lot of municipalities, maybe larger ones, but for a small one, that is a tremendous amount of money. And they're having to make that decision. So to me, it's about 2,000 people in the town of Digby. Do they need seven? Do they need four? Do they need five? Um, I'm, I think that's a bigger question than a municipality of 2,000 people with only seven councillors can be expected to add, to decide on their own. I think if there's an opportunity or there's a, a, um, a need for the province to step in. The province owns, don't forget, the, the provincial government in every province owns the municipal sector. They created it, they set it up, they, have the, they own the legislation, they decide everything. Uh, so, and I always find it a little disturbing that the province is 
we'll sort of say, well, you wanted to be autonomous, so here, go make these decisions. But they don't really recognize that capacity issue. And I think that's what's one of the things here that you're asking a very small municipality um, to make a very big decision with not a lot of support, uh, technical support, financial support, professional support. Context is also important here. And we talked about this in another story, because <clears throat> as you know very, very well, as you go across the country, what a municipality is in any province or territory is completely different sometimes from the others. They have different legislation, different responsibilities, different expectations. It's a different ball game in every single sub-federal jurisdiction. And in the case of Nova Scotia, uh, like if, if you had a town in Newfoundland Labrador of 2,000 people wondering whether they should have four or seven councillors, that would be a far different discussion. There's 75% of the municipalities in Newfoundland have fewer than 1,000 people. And almost all of them have five councillors or seven. In Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia, with double the population, has 49 municipalities. So they have large regional municipalities, um, sort of counties or districts, whatever they, they use the words interchangeably. And then they have small independent the town of. So the town of Digby exists on its own with its own set of bylaws, its own authority within the district, the municipality of the district of Digby, which is a much bigger place, has over 7,000 people. Um, so this conversation that the town of Digby is having about should, do we need seven is in the context of much larger municipalities having seven or a few more. It certainly could. Uh, we'll be right back because we've been talking about Newfoundland and Labrador a bit here. So let's head over to our interview. We'll be right back after a quick break with Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador CEO Rob Nolan. Welcome to the Political Trenches Local Government Network. Our guest today is Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador CEO Rob Nolan. Rob is passionate about municipal affairs and governance, serving on the board of directors for Happy City St. John's from 2015 to 2020, including two years as chair, co-founding the municipal advocacy group Citizens Assembly for Stronger Elections in 2017, and managing and advising on multiple municipal campaigns throughout the province. Rob holds an MBA and Master's of Arts from Memorial University and a postgraduate certificate in public policy and governance from the University of Victoria. During his Master's of Arts studies in political science, Rob completed a thesis on local governance in Newfoundland and Labrador. Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador, or MNL, formed in 1951 to represent the interests of the growing number of municipal councils in the province. Today, there are 276 incorporated municipalities representing 89% of the provincial population. With that, Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So I want to start by asking the general overarching question that we've used on a lot of these episodes, and that is, can you provide a brief overview on the current state of municipalities in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador? Yeah, it's a great question to start on. Um, so our towns and cities in Newfoundland and Labrador are, uh, we would say, doing the best with what they have. So you mentioned in um, your intro that it's 276 municipalities. We have a province of 540,000 people. So that's a lot of uh, municipalities for our population. And that's not accounting for the over 100 uh, local service districts and unincorporated areas in the province. Um, so we have 78% uh, of that 275 um, that have below 1,000 uh, people in population. Most of those have uh, one town clerk, and often it's the case that they're part-time. So that would look like a uh, town clerk that might work two afternoons or two mornings a week. Um, uh, so our municipalities, for the most part, are very low capacity to uh, address their needs. Um, but they do the best with what they have. You know, our town leaders are doing great things for the residents. Town leaders and town administrators are dedicated and passionate about the work, um, but they're they're dramatically under-resourced um, in our towns. 
Um, so we've been advocating for a new fiscal framework um, to address that over the last few years. Um, and Chris, I know you've had a few people on that have talked about FCM's municipal growth framework. Um, so we're looping into that discourse as well to try to leverage um, that conversation. Um, there are challenges here, just like the rest of the country, just like you hear on the show all the time. Rural areas continue to see shrinking populations. Our uh, St. John's metro area is the only area of the province really that has a growing population or projected growing population. Um, and with that comes um, shrinking tax bases. And our towns, of course, like the rest of Canada or like most provinces in Canada, rely on property tax. So as you have a shrinking tax base, um, it's shrinking finances uh, for those communities as well. Um, and that doesn't mean that the costs and ex expenditures for those towns go down, right? We have an infrastructure deficit, um, greatly aging infrastructure across the province. So those costs, for one, are only going up while uh, the revenues are going down for our towns. So um, so our towns are, are low capacity and, and uh, strapped for resources at the moment, but they're doing their best. And we have some great leaders in those towns that are, uh, you know, working together to try to, and working with us to try to find solutions. Absolutely. And you have been doing a lot of work. You have been uh, covering a lot of ground with the Strat Plan, covering a lot of ground in terms of um, moving specific files forward, as opposed to trying to be everything to everybody, which, you know, is the whole point of a strategic plan, that you're not everything to everybody, in which case you're nothing to anybody. Um, but I'm interested in what ways you've been successful. You mentioned that you got an increase in the operating grants, the municipal operating grants, which is a legit big deal. I mean, that, that was a long time coming. Uh, and your point about the fact that, you know, there should be a more robust formula that actually moves with the times as opposed to relying on an M&L showing up every 10 years, banging on the door saying, can you please increase this or change this? I think that's a it's a great point to make. But what other successes have you had recently supporting municipalities and all of their sort of unique challenges? It's interesting because our biggest successes, you know, over the last year and a half um, really stretch over multiple priorities for us. I think they all touch on fiscal stability, because if you're dealing mm. with um, funding directly, obviously, is within fiscal stability. But then um, everything else that a municipality does, either we need to be working toward fiscal stability in order to meet their needs or meeting their needs helps with the overall system of fiscal stability. Um, so the MOGs is, is a big one that we were proud of. This year, we advocated um, jointly with PMA, Professional Municipal Administrators Association, and uh, Newfoundland and Labrador Fire Services Association um, to get an increase to uh, funding for municipal fire departments. And that one's one that, that might seem a little bit, certainly not for you, uh, for either of you, I'd say, but for some people to say it might seem a bit out of the municipal realm, but um, our fire departments in Newfoundland and Labrador are run by, uh, or they're under the municipalities, um, and most of them are volunteer fire departments. Uh, for over a decade, this is another over a decade issue, um, they received the same funding um, for outside of municipal boundaries calls. So that might be often, that was highway collisions um, that they were responding to that were outside of municipal boundaries. We know that, uh, and we were able to, to show from, from run, running the data that um, highway collisions and outside of municipal boundary calls um, have gone up dramatically over the last 15 years or so. Um, they, they are more often and more acute um, in terms of, of what's going on. Um, and they cost more. So just, you know, just the cost of diesel for the fire trucks has gone up dramatically in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, and we hadn't seen an increase in the funding, which meant that municipalities had to backstop that. So when it, when the costs went up and fire departments had additional costs from um, responses outside of municipal boundaries, the municipalities just had to find it in their budgets in order to pay for that. So uh, we worked uh, with multiple departments um, to advocate for an increase to funding in that. We got it. Um, we got an increase in uh, municipal training funding this year. That's another one that hadn't been um, increased in another in a number of years, while travel costs and and the need for training 
um, had dramatically gone up over the last few years. And uh, so that was a big one. That's another one. That, that's why I say crossing over um, multiple strategic priorities because, um, you know, training is really important for uh, strong governance in municipalities. Um, but allowing municipalities to afford that training is part of the bigger picture of fiscal stability and training councils and administrators in financial management is part of the bigger picture of fiscal stability. Um, another win would be um, wastewater systems effluent um, amendments. So reopening those amendments. Um, and that has been a big challenge for uh, municipalities. I think there's about 100 municipalities still in our province that uh, don't meet the wastewater systems effluent regulations. So that means that they're essentially pumping wastewater sewage out into the ocean at varying levels of, of filtration. Um, and we're working on that one. That's that's a, certainly a focus of ours over the next little while also. Um, and then another win would be, um, I mentioned the housing capacity building officers that are new staff on our team. And uh, and we worked to get funding from ACOA um, and uh, immigration population growth and skills here in Newfoundland and Labrador to get two positions that will work directly with municipalities um, to get funding related to housing. So we saw with the housing um, accelerator fund, the half, um, we had maybe a dozen out of our municipalities. So that's a dozen out of 276 that uh, put in proposals for the half. And we maybe half of those, half of the half applications <laughs> uh, got approved, uh, got the funding. Um, and most of the challenge there was just capacity, both capacity yeah. in terms of um, being in a state of readiness, as our director of advocacy, uh, Dr. Dietrich Walsh likes to say, being in a state of readiness to apply for programming when it comes down the line from the feds or the province, but also just filling out the applications. If you have a town clerk who's working two afternoons a week and is dealing with the administration of a town, how are you supposed to, first of all, know about a program? Second of all, collect all the information and then actually put in an application. It's impossible for some of these some of these towns to reach on that. Um, and you know, as we know, the housing crisis and issues with housing and homelessness are affecting all scales of municipalities. So these two positions that we've hired um, are a big win and and a big move for us that they're going to work directly with these municipalities to make sure they're in a state of readiness. So that means doing housing needs assessments, collecting data, other things. And then when programming comes down the line related to housing, um, they're going to be able to help those towns reach on that. Um, and that's direct housing programming. So the half, for example, um, but it could be other types of programming like infrastructure funding that we know is required in order to build out, in order to develop in these towns. Um, so that that's a, that's a big one for us, I think, a big priority, but also something we're really excited about. I'm, I'm going to jump in if you don't mind, and hopefully if you don't mind, Rob, and I apologize for asking this mid-interview, but hopefully you have an extra five minutes because I have two questions I want to ask, and they're important questions because we are a year and a bit from the next municipal general election in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, and I'm asking this question, we're recording this interview, a day after a nomination for a by-election just closed in your province in a town called Whitless Bay, where not one person put their name forward to run for that by-election. Um, is MNL seeing any apathy around stepping up from residents and wanting to run in the municipal sector? Because 10, 15 years ago, you would see an abundance of people on that ballot, but it is slowly shrinking to a smaller, unless you go to St. Paul's uh, by-election in Toronto, the federal one where there's 87 people running, you don't traditionally see the amount of candidates on the ballot municipally that you did 10, 15 years ago. Do you see that as CEO of MNL? And how do you, as the organization, try to address that issue to get people more involved and interested in putting their hand up and on that ballot? Such an important conversation that I think we have on a daily basis right now. Um, I would push back against the suggestion that this is a really new issue. It's certainly worsening. 
Um, but I wouldn't say, and, and Craig, correct me if I'm wrong, since you were in this role then, but I wouldn't say 10 to 15 years ago, it was a whole lot better. We were still experiencing a great deal of acclamations um, on councils and a concerning number of vacant seats um, across councils. Um, you know, at least within the last 10 years, you were certainly um, seeing that. Um, voter turnout um, in local elections, uh, you know, we seem to hover around 40%, I think. Um, so it's it's typically quite low, even just in terms of voter turnout. Um, so interest is low um, and, and there are uh, mounting problems that is getting worse. You know, not the least reason being that we have the oldest population in Canada, fastest aging population in Canada. So people are just, a lot of people in communities are aging out of being on council or, or running for council. Um, there's can I also- interject there for a second? Can I, can I interject yes, please, there for a second? Yeah. Because um, I, I forget the name of the community and you guys probably know this off the top of your head, but there was an 18 year old just elected through a by-election literally this year or a claim to a by-election seat while you're talking about aging out, are you seeing more youth trying to get involved in municipal politics? Because, and I hate to say it this way as the municipal advocate and as the municipal show, but traditionally people look at municipal politics, municipal governance as stepping stones to a potential political career provincially or even federally. Are you seeing more people, yeah. more younger generation saying, I could be a counselor and I'm 18, so why not put my name on the ballot? Um, I, I hope that um, we see younger um, folks running for councils. We certainly uh, are putting effort into it. So we have a youth youth committee, um, um, uh, a youth committee of the board of directors um, that has councillors and administrators who are either, you know, young by age or young at heart, but certainly want to get more youth um, around the tables. Um, and last year we started, we had our, we had our first um, youth simulated council uh, debate at um, our conference last year. And we're gonna do the same thing this year. Um, and that's meant to get high school students and post-secondary students, um, you know, more excited, like you're talking about, uh, about running for local government. Um, we have a make your mark um, campaign that we run um, in the lead up to elections. And the intent behind that is to, first of all, encourage more people to run for councils, uh, but also get more diversity right across the board, all types of diversity uh, around council tables. Um, and that's been a that's been a successful campaign. That's something that we're doing. But you're right. You know, local government is um, low engagement from voters. Um often, you know, low voter turnout. Um, and and it's the left, it's the order of government that most often um, it depends on name recognition, right? Uh, ultimately, how many signs you get out or do people know you in your community or whatever it might be. Um, and that can be daunting. If you want, if you, you know, if you're a smart person with bright ideas, innovative ideas for your community, but you don't necessarily um, have the network going into that, it can be really intimidating um, going into that space trying to run. Um, but we want to put it out there that anyone who's interested, anyone who has great ideas about local government, anyone who you know is excited about municipal politics, wants to make a difference in their community, this is a great way to do it. And uh, you know, I think the three of us really think that um, local government is exciting. And, and I know the nine people here on our team um, are passionate and, and find it exciting. So it's just about, you know, getting that message out there that that this is the real way to make a difference in your community and, and you know, sitting around the council table can be exciting and can give you a real opportunity. This whole show, Chris's whole purpose in doing this is to keep looking forward, seeing where we're going, finding, you know, the right path, an optimistic path forward. Um, with that in mind, where do you see the municipal sector in Newfoundland and Labrador in the future? Like if, as a strategic planning guy, if I was to say to you, we're in a visioning exercise now, mm -hmm. and you're responsible for the entire municipal sector, <laughs> what's your vision 20, 20 years from now? What does it look like? It's a big question. Uh, um, <laughs> capacity, as, as we've talked a little bit about, and we started talking about capacity is sector capacity is the biggest challenge, in my opinion. 
uh, not just my opinion, it is the biggest challenge. You know, wh whether you're talking about human resources, you're talking about finances, you're talking about population, any of that um, capacity is the biggest issue. How do we overcome capacity? Um, issues. You know, um, we don't have control over whether people are going to be moving into these communities. We can help make them more welcoming communities. We can do work, uh, you know, to to try to try to get more immigration. But you know, that's on the provinces uh, and the and the feds' uh, responsibility. Uh, what we can do is help communities work together to overcome their capacity gaps together. Um, so you know, up until last year, MNL had a big push on regionalization and regional government as part of that. I'm still a firm believer that we need, uh, strategically, we need a formalized regional structure um, because it can't be done ad hoc. You can't depend on the volunteers, mostly volunteers around or unpaid counselors around the tables um, to do it because you have, you know, you have a few mayors um, in a neighboring um, area who really want to work together. They do great stuff. And then an election comes couple of the mayors um, get overturned and the new mayors might not want to work with the neighboring uh, communities. And if it's ad hoc, yeah, that's baby out with the bathwater, right? Um, so we continue that conversation. In the meantime, current government, current provincial government has uh, explicitly said they're not moving forward with regional government. So we as MNL have to figure out how do we support our members to work regionally. Big piece of that is in the regional economic development space. Um, so we're looking for, you know, regions of the province, um, projects, pilot projects right now um, uh, for the next year to two years. That's that's a priority with that, um, where there are neighboring communities that want to come together under a formal structure to do regional economic development. That's not just up to the towns, but, uh, you know, multiple organizations are working on that. I would like to see longer term that there be formalized structures in place for regional economic development um, for the communities. That helps with all of the challenges that we were talking about, right? The human resource and labor market piece, the population and immigration piece, um, as well as the finances piece for um, the communities. Um, and I think regional collaboration in general, so there's the, re there's the economic development piece, but then there's also the things that are much more obviously under jurisdiction of the provinces or of the uh, municipalities and towns um, that many small towns right now just can't meet the basic services that they're meant to provide. But if they band together as three or four communities neighboring each other, um, then they could hire a resource or they could come together and put those resources together. Um, right now, in the absence of a formalized structure, um, I want us to be working with uh, communities to focus on that regional approach as as has been the language of MNL for a few years. Um, but how do we, you know, have some case studies? How do we have some pilot projects where we can say, okay, this group of communities in Central, four or five communities came together and solved this capacity gap. Now we know that that's replicable and we know it's scalable and we can move that around the province and say, hey, group of three or six communities that are experiencing the same type of problem, we have a model for you to use. Rob, I want to thank you from both Craig and myself for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and do this. It's always a pleasure to talk about municipal issues and municipal affairs with people in the municipal sector. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So our full interview with MNL CEO Rob Nolan will be airing next Wednesday. We'll be right back after a quick break. Craig, thank you so much from uh, me and, well, I guess Ian as well, but he's not here, but he can text you afterwards for joining us in the political <laughs> trenches. It, it was a great interview uh, with Rob. It was a great discussion of the top stories uh, municipally across Canada. So hopefully you've enjoyed yourself. I've had a ball. I really appreciate the opportunity. I, I'm very thankful to Ian for taking some time off and opening this space up for me. And uh, with any luck, when he sees it, it'll I'll pass muster. We'll be good, I hope. <laughs> what's what's on the agenda for the next few weeks for yourself? Because we always talk about what the future, as we said in, in our interview with Rob. For yeah. you, what's, what's on the agenda now? Oh, well, we've got a couple strategic plans that we're doing. Uh, one in New Brunswick, one here uh, with strategic steps. Uh, we've got some 
organizational review type work that we're, we're cluing up. And from my end of things, I just got back from uh, Summerside PEI, where I, I ran the Atlantic Mayor's Congress, which is a uh, an organization that meets twice a year. And they've been doing that for about 22 years now, something like that. So they recently asked me to come on and be their executive director. So I have so much unpacking to do from that. That was a three-day conference. They've never had a three-day conference before. It's normally uh, mayors sitting around sort of a hollow square talking to one another about what's happening in their communities. And we sort of blew it up and said, no, you're going to have a conference and we're going to have speakers in. So we had Minister Fraser, Minister Sean Fraser, Minister Goody Hutchings. We had three of the provincial housing ministers from Atlantic Canada uh, who were there. Um, it was a really, it was an interesting few days. We brought them out to uh, see some housing developments and put them sort of in situ on site to talk about housing. And there's a lot now for me to sort of unpack and uh, reach out to all those folks and say, well, what did you like about this and where should we go next? So it's exciting times. Where so you say two a year, or this is the first one I'm assuming in Summerside. Where's the next one, if you don't mind me asking? The next one is going to be New Brunswick. I can't reveal the specific municipality yet, but it's New oh. Brunswick's turn, and I will. I am not allowed to say yet where the next one actually is. Well, once coming you know, soon. Once you know, you better let us know. Um, Craig, it is Absolutely. a pleasure to sit down with you and chat in the political trenches. If, to everyone who's listening, thank you so much for tuning in for another great episode. We'll be back in uh, last in another two weeks for our final episode of the summer before we take our August hiatus, and we'll be back in September. So tune in in two weeks' time when Ian returns, and uh, we'll discuss the next big municipal story. So, Craig, always a pleasure. Thanks very much, Chris. Take care.